welcome to this latest pod vid uh, looking at solo wargaming and today I'm going to just talk very briefly uh, in this uh, short pod vid about scenery and you might think well you know what's that got to do with solo wargaming everybody uses scenery no matter who you are and of course you're right but there's a couple of aspects of scenery which are somewhat unique I think to solo wargaming and there's a number of ways in which solo wargaming impacts on the scenery that you have. Now of course not all of these impacts affect everybody and there are going to be some specific things that affect specific people so I'm going to be talking pretty generically here but my thoughts on scenery as a solo modeler kind of fall into two categories. Firstly I think as a solo modeler we tend to play smaller games it's not so easy when there's only one of you and you're playing against yourself all the time to be playing the really big tabletop battles. So our scenery tends to be uh, limited to smaller tables, perhaps fewer forces, and that's going to have an impact. Perhaps we have more important features, so perhaps we might have more bridges or more specific buildings radar centers whatever it happens to be the second one which i think impacts more perhaps on me these days um, and therefore i think is felt more is the fact that um, some time ago i used to be involved with a war games club and there used to be sort of half a dozen of us that used to get together on a kind of regular basis as as, as regular as you ever can do I'm talking here the pre-pandemic of course and some nights we play on Bill's table and some nights we play on Fred's table and some nights we play on George's table and there will be different styles of table different you know different guys have different scenery and you've got lots of variation in terms of the environment in which you played with your soldiers now if you're a solo wargamer there is no Bill and Charlie and George it's just you so you tend to have to create that variation on your own and I must confess as a result of that over the years I've collected an, an enormous amount of scenery I've probably got more scenery than I would have if I were fighting my games with other guys because you know I'm not relying on other people to provide that variation so on my table I use these scenery boards which are 2 foot by 18 inches some are 2 foot by 12 inches cut from 6 mil MDF faced on both sides and I have this uh, road system which allows all the boards to be put together in a, a large number of ways and I have some river ones the same so the, the road and river boards can all sit together and I've probably got 30 of these and you can um, put them together and create a wide variety of uh, board formations with roads and rivers and that gives me that flexibility that I want I have to say if I was doing this again now I'd probably go for two foot by two foot boards I now have a place where I can store a board of that size whereas when I first started this I didn't and if you get a tape measure out and you make work out how big a two foot by two foot board is you'll realize that it's not the easiest thing to store it won't go in a cupboard or a wardrobe the damn thing's too big so that was one of the reasons why I went for the smaller boards the, the, I had to put them into a wardrobe and to get them stored now I would go for bigger boards and in fact I am looking at producing some more kind of desert slash scrubland surfaces the ones I have are quite green if I go for the scrubland ones I'll probably go for a two foot boards because I tend to play either four foot by four foot or six foot by four foot tables that is a product of what I said earlier about playing smaller games I quite enjoy smaller games and this variation of board starts to give me all that variety on top of that I have quite a number of hedges fences trees um, what I call terrain pieces which are kind of rocks and bushes and that kind of thing trenches um, 
and all this kind of stuff far more than you would have normally if you were relying on other people to chip in with bits and pieces when you set up a game. Now having to come up with a wide variety of scenic pieces impacts on the economics of it all. It's not easy to simply collect a large number of different armies and vast armies of each if you're having to commit a fair amount of your budget to scenery. So that leads on to not necessarily buying scenery but perhaps making your own. Now in terms of buildings, which, which is the biggest scenic aspect that most of us come across, uh, you can use airfix kits like this control tower. This is a Italeri uh, farmhouse, again a plastic kit. Or you can make your own. This is plastic card. This is purely and simply from a dimension taken out of, um, a, in my case, a railway modelling magazine and creating a building which I've seen uh, in a photograph. And once it's all painted up, it becomes a feature of a game. And you can actually put all these buildings together. This is um, part of a board that was meant to be uh, Gila Harbour in Sicily. And there are resin models, there are plastic kits. The big warehouse on the right in the foreground I think is homemade. So you can mix them all together quite happily and, uh, and come up with a big table. But it does demand a lot of buildings. The fun part of scenery comes in making your own. Uh, back in the day I used to use uh, odd bits of cork, cork tile, faced with um, a bit of scatter material and then rocks out the garden, a bit of lichen. And uh, I was happy with them, they were cheap, very easy to make and fun to do of an afternoon and gave you something to scatter around the battlefield. Sometimes uh, odd bits of polystyrene like this, twig from the garden, bit of paint, bit of scatter material, gave you a trench, remembering as I didn't do in this case to make sure that the trench is big enough to be able to stand your troops in. But it's, you know, it's a cheap way of producing scenery. These days uh, I've moved on to using these MDF circular bases either for just sort of general material for broken ground, sometimes you can use pieces of uh, rock. I think this is actually old bits of wall blaster that are stuck on and painted. Again, a bit of lichen, a bit of scatter material. And you can add the odd tree. In terms of things like walls, you can buy these uh, Bellona pieces, paint them up. Uh, they're again, quite cheap. But uh, I've moved on to making my own walls. This is simply a piece of plastic card and on the top of it is um, a bead of one of these no nails instant stick type glues out of a gun and then I've scattered on stones that come out of the bottom of a fish tank and then you put another row on top of the first row and a third row on top of the second row and you end up with a wall that's about three quarters of an inch high. You can paint them and make broken bits as well. Similarly, rubberized horsehair that comes about half inch thick in uh, A4 sheets, cut it into uh, strips, three or four inches long, card base, a bit of flock, and you've got yourself a hedge. Laser cut models are quite cheap, so they're a good idea. This is a laser cut sides of a bridge. The base of the bridge, incidentally, is simply cut up stirrers from your local coffee shop. And there's an example here of a road river bridge, sorry, a road river board with a bridge over it, some scatter pieces in the foreground, and then those hedges along the far bank. And so you can make quite an attractive table. Now, as far as hills are concerned, I used to use lumps of polystyrene. They look like lumps of polystyrene. I moved on to the sort of layer cake hills wasn't impressed with those and I'm currently working on a modular hill system using card and polystyrene infills that uh, I think they're going to end up being sort of nine inch square pieces and they can all fit together across the battlefield but you know they're all cheap and all easy and fun to make. 
the basis for a lot of my models is picture framing card and the easiest way to get hold of that is to go to your local picture framers and ask him for any offcuts he's got. Most of them either give it away to the local modeling club or the local art college or if you want some they'll give you a bag full and I got a whole bag full for nothing. He was glad to get rid of it because he's only going to throw it away or recycle it. It comes in uh, about one millimeter thicknesses. Some of it's a little bit heavier but most of it's one millimeter thick. Never mind the color because you're going to paint it but it's really useful stuff and it takes glue and paint quite well so you can use it for all sorts of bases so things like this this bridge has got uh, underneath the plastic card facing is simply made out of uh, picture framing card similarly this harbour again this is the Gila Harbour uh, board this is probably the biggest thing I've made this is about two foot square this harbour sits over one of my C boards that's uh, incidentally has been uh, varnished since this picture was taken so it's got a better sheen to it but you can see you can make a kind of harbour wharfy type thing with a um, an end a circular end piece just take just look at photographs of, of your average harbour and you'll, you'll get some ideas of some of the features that you want and here is that same harbour and part of the Gila town and that's the airfix uh, traveling crane that's sitting on the front there and in the foreground just in front of it is the airfix uh, garage kit that makes quite a useful little uh, dockside building so I'm not going to say anymore it's um, there is a link I think between solo wargaming and scenery it tends to be the amount of scenery and the style of scenery that you have uh, for me as a model maker and I, I model a number of um, different environments making the scenery is quite good fun uh, I enjoy it it's it's quite freelance you don't have to be wildly accurate if you're making a bridge over a river or you're making a base to put some trees and a bit of rocks on you can use whatever size base you've got to hand uh, needless to say I, I tend to buy cheap trees you can if you're a if you know anybody from the railway modelling world you'll know that you can pay 8, 10, 12 pounds for a big specimen tree you certainly don't want to be doing that I tend to buy uh, cheap plastic trees from eBay and once you've painted them they look fine for what we want you know you're not you're not trying to produce scale model trees here you're, you're, you're trying to produce something that can either be fought over or is used as a battlefield piece so bear that in mind so making your own scenery can be cheap and fun so having explored the world of scenery we're going to dive back now into Heroes All there's a couple of aspects of Heroes All that we haven't covered as yet some of the bits around the edges morale I didn't cover because essentially we're talking solo wargaming here and Heroes All is a two person game but I will cover morale just that if you want to play a Heroes All game and we'll talk about how Heroes All works as a mechanism you'll see how uh, morale fits in and there's also some things that are in Heroes All that transfer over into Fight Your Own Battles particularly things like how engineers work uh, and a particular set of rules uh, around what I call work and tasks so when you've got a job to do how do you work out when it's done you stay around for that and uh, talk to you soon Look, you know how this works. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, hit the notifications bell, and when more stuff arrives, you'll be the first to know.